thinking back to the very early days of the peace research movement, and particularly in connection with the development of PRIO, people came into the field from all sorts of different backgrounds and experiences, social, political, intellectual. What was yours, and how did you first get interested in, in the field? I think the, um, uh, the, um, the first step, or the background, uh, really was rather trivial. <clears throat> One day, uh, I was sitting in the... Uh, in the offices of the Students' Association. Mm -hmm. I was the deputy chairman of the Students' Association. Mm -hmm. And I got a telephone call, and the telephone call was for, from a friend of mine who established contact between uh, Johan Gautung and myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question was, uh, would I, uh, could, I, could I think of uh, becoming an assistant to him? And there was payment uh, following with that, uh, mm -hmm. a monthly uh, nice sum of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, 1968, uh, uh, one would have been a fool not to accept such an offer. Or that was the uh, sort of the usual way of, of seeing it. Mm. So uh, I, I was much interested in international affairs uh, before it came to that. But, mm. uh, but this was uh, what brought me uh, to uh, the Peace Research Institute and mm. the Inter Peace Research. Mm. Otherwise, it could have taken uh, other paths. Mm. Mm. Um, what did you think you were getting into, in, into this field of peace research? Because I remember back in the 1960s, at least in England, it wasn't mm. quite respectable. You know, it wasn't a way into academic life. Uh, were you thinking of becoming an academic, or uh, were you thinking of going into government? Or what did you think you were... You were sort of going into PRIO, what was... I don't think I had my plans set uh, uh, at that stage in, mm. in 68. I knew what I was going to at the Peace Research Institute mm -hmm. because uh, I was going to assist uh, Johan Galtung on a project which uh, uh, was financed by the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. He was doing a, a project uh, for the Council of, of Europe on, on East-West affairs and, uh, and uh, including, uh, of course, uh, whatever role uh, one might envisage at that stage for the Council of Europe mm. in the all-European context. Yeah. So that much uh, was clear, and uh, in student politics, I belonged to the uh, things. And so the, um, um, the uh, radical, uh, if I may use that term, orientation of peace research and of the Peace Research Institute was mm. not particularly what are problematical to me mm. at, uh, at that time. Uh, but you are right, uh, uh, this was a controversial discipline uh, in Norway. Mm. And I think Johan Galtung himself said on one occasion, referring to times before, before I got into it, mm. when peace research was introduced first as a department of the Institute for Social Research, uh, 59, mm. and then it became an independent institute, I think that was in 64, a few, a few years yes. later. Mm when that very expression or, or that very term peace research was introduced mm -hmm. uh, there was obviously opposition mm -hmm. uh, opposition from corners who uh, who said at the same time uh, to war research there could be no objection but peace research uh, definitely mm. why why do you think there was this sort of cloud of doubt about peace research about peace because I found no, one one part of it was certainly that the Soviet Union used uh, uh, the term peace in its uh, mm. propaganda, <clears throat> propaganda with a negative connotation mm. in uh, the, the way we use the term, but positively for the for the, for the Soviets, mm. and uh, hence the very term became uh, a part of uh, of the uh, East-West, almost of the East-West conflict. Mm. Mm. Uh, brewing a bit on that, um, uh, I was invited by an economics professor uh, around 1970 uh, to, uh, to take part in a small, small uh, calculation of uh, the number of people <coughs> lost in World War II in the NATO area and in the Warsaw Pact area mm. as a percentage of the populations in those areas in 1938. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the population, the, the, the number, uh, the casualties uh, in the NATO area were a bit less than 1%, and for the Warsaw Pact area, more than 10%. And then you may, then mm. you may 
ask is that just a matter of uh, the difference? Is it a matter of degree or is it something more? Does it translate into something qualitatively uh, different? Mm. That may also have been a part of, uh, of the uh, uh, uses of, uh, of the term peace mm. uh, in the East and in the West. Uh, by and large, the casualties were in the East, mm. not in the West. Yeah. But then back to your question, mm. um, uh, uh, Johan Galtung was such a towering figure uh, in uh, Norwegian debate mm. uh, that there was a personality factor into it also. Mm. And uh, Johan Galtung became very controversial and so the controversy over peace research was also associated with the uh, sort of personal controversy. Mm -hmm. Uh, surrounding that uh, that leading uh, uh, researcher. Mm. Well, part of that context was that you were getting into an organisation which was the Peace Research Institute, and um, at the time, my memory is that there was some kind of a debate between were we de were we de dealing with peace research or were we dealing with conflict research, uh, which was a very hot topic in at least in England. Now, were you conscious at all of the? division between the two things and did it mean anything or was it you know? not so much mm. but we spent a lot of time discussing uh, uh, the the concept of peace mm -hmm. uh, peace research of course has uh, one value orientation and one only towards mm. uh, towards peace mm. um, and once again johan galtung was the um, uh, was the leading light mm. in in that discussion but uh, but i can't remember that we sort of juxtaposed uh, conflict and mm. peace mm. Uh, very much, not, not, not here. Mm. Mm. You were lucky to be spared that particular one, believe me. I think me. so, I think so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, um, the other aspect of it at, at those times, I think if I remember correctly, was um, there was a very strong push to, to develop what we were doing into a, a field or a discipline or uh, something that was um, uh, scientific, that was a, a big word that we had at the mm. time and um, uh, I assume that a similar kind of ambition existed in, um, in, in Oslo uh, or were you not too bothered by that, uh, by that debate? Uh, I think there was, there was such an ambition mm. and if you look at uh, the volumes of the Journal of Peace Research mm. uh, in the 60s and into the 70s <clears throat> uh, much of it uh, uh, based on quantitative uh, mm. methodology. Uh, there might have been such an uh, such an ambition. Mm. You sound a little dubious about whether the ambition was fulfilled. And then um, the quantitative methods, uh, of course, they uh, they have been followed up, and they mm. always have a role. Uh, uh, but then there are also many other approaches uh, mm. uh, which have proven fruitful over the years. Uh, but around 1970, mm. it was very much uh, based on, uh, on uh, uh, it was very much a matter of relating data to, to theory mm. <coughs> and, uh, and applying uh, quantitative uh, methodology. Mm. However, um, we were also raised to combine uh, data and values, mm -hmm. applied research that is. And for that matter, uh, although uh, the state of the social sciences is such that you can seldom make much out of it, but uh, it's also, uh, sometimes it's also possible to combine theory and values. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, for instance, a, uh, you know, a lot about how, how sanctions uh, uh, function mm. in the international system. And uh, when a new case pops up, uh, say Burma, mm. uh, it, uh, it is sometimes possible then to, uh, to relate uh, uh, the value, uh, regime change mm. or overthrowing the regime eventually in, in Burma. Uh, and uh, and uh, the theory of sanctions, mm. <laughs> and then say something about what is likely to work uh, and what would not work, mm. uh, not by making special uh, empirical studies of the case, mm. uh, mm -hmm. but again from what you know, from the theory that has been built up, uh, you may be able to say something mm. about that. 
But of course, uh, uh, this is uh, not so often the case. So you, uh, you went to Prio as a political scientist and you went to work for Johann Galtung and you were there for quite a while before you uh, left and then came back as director. Over, that, over the period, the early period, how did your thinking change? What, what happened to your thinking and what happened to thinking in Prio as well? Then I began a line of research which I have uh, been following up till this mm. day, uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons, non-proliferation mm. policies. And by 1975, I was working full steam on, uh, on those issues. Mm. And I wrote for the Cypri yearbook out of Oslo yeah. mm. in the beginnings, 76, 7 and 8, I think, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the chapters, yearbook chapters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on uh, nuclear proliferation, non-proliferation mm. policies. Mm. This was still from your place at Prio, though? You this hadn't... was still from my place in, I should say, Oslo, rather, uh, because mm. uh, in 1973 uh, I got a five-yearly uh, research grant from the uh, University of Oslo. Ah. So I was lecturing a bit in the 70s mm -hmm. uh, at the University of Oslo mm. while having my office at, uh, at Prio. Ah, okay. But I was formerly uh, a member of the university staff, political science staff, between 73 and 78 or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A dual affiliation in reality. Well, many yeah. of us managed to do that. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, this is not on my list. Did you enjoy teaching? <laughs> I did. I did. Um, uh, maybe I should uh, qualify it by saying that uh, I had uh, one, t I had two hours per week, it wasn't more than that, mm -hmm. because this was a research position first right. of all. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, teaching to that amount, uh, that tiny amount, uh, was fine with me. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I liked that. Yes. You were not overwhelmed with uh, students. I was not. Uh, good. Um, so um, you had the five-year grant and you did the study and you were writing for CIPRI and um, in the meantime what was happening to your colleagues at uh, the institute? Uh, at, um, uh, was Johan still around at that particular point in time? Johan was, uh, uh, was elsewhere. Uh, mm. But of course, uh, he was back on visit, mm. uh, but we saw him uh, fairly, uh, fairly seldom mm. at that point in time. Mm. So there was a group of uh, five, six people, that was the core uh, mm. of it, uh, who then, who then uh, ran, the, ran the institute. And uh, to my recollection, the first permanent positions at, uh, at Prio. Mm -hmm. uh, very established, <clears throat> well, it was in the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. Financed how? Financed, uh, there was a grant, uh, there was a, uh, an amount of money from, uh, from the ministry mm -hmm. uh, for, well, it has had different names over the years, but this was for higher education and, and research. Mm. Um, uh, there was uh, project support from the uh, National Research Council. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was more than one, I think, at, uh, mm. at that time. Uh, miscellaneous. Mm. Um, mm. And that has remained the case, by the way, at these institutions. Oh, yes, yeah. <clears throat> I know that only too well, I'm afraid. Um, so who became director after Johann uh, began his voyages? This was a rotation system. Oh, okay. Uh, say a couple of years and then on to another one. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and that uh, that had strengths and it had uh, its uh, its weaknesses also, of mm. course. Yeah. Yes, it's rather like the British system of revolving chairs in, of departments in universities. Uh, uh, the senior people take turns at it. Right. And it functioned uh, well for a period of time mm. in the mid seventies because there was an entrepreneurial spirit about it all. Mm. <clears throat> Uh, but later on, uh, uh, the weaknesses popped up, mm. uh, and I think uh, over the long haul, the weakness of, uh, of uh, such uh, a way of doing it mm. is that uh, you know, institution building mm. uh, doesn't happen, or the leadership is not strong enough mm. uh, to take the institution forward. Mm. 
It can function if you have a particularly strong uh, sort of spirit, uh, mm. uh, but uh, these are spirits of the moment, and over mm. the long haul, it doesn't work out so well. Mm. Yeah. It's not a con continuity is necessary, I think, for institution right, building right, and right. continuity of leadership. I think you're yeah. right. Um, s thinking back to those days in the you know, the late 60s, the 70s. Um, how did how was Prio building networks in Scandinavia first of all, and then outside Scandinavia? I mean, what were your international con contacts at that time? Nordic Peace Research Conferences, mm -hmm. and then there was the International Peace Research Association at the time. Mm. Of course, uh, we also took part in the International Studies Association meetings, uh, International Political Science Association conferences. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just the peace research networks uh, uh, and Pagwash, but mm. uh, but also uh, a variety of other networks. Yeah. Yeah. Though it, my memory is that it took a very long time to interest the International Studies Association in having a peace research section. I mean, I think it happened mm -hmm. in the end, but yeah. uh, it was a bit of a struggle, oh, yeah. if I remember rightly. I yeah. think that's true. Yeah. Um, so, um, how did you arrive at CIPRI? What was the what was the process of you of you going there? Mm, the beginning, uh, the beginning must have been. Um, Frank Barnaby's uh, mm -hmm. commissioning of new book chapters ah, okay. on uh, proliferation issues. Mm. Um, we were close. He came to Oslo now and then to see me. He would stay in Oslo for a whole day and mm. we discussed for a whole day. Mm -hmm. uh, Rolf Björnstedt uh, uh, had uh, just come back from the UN mm. in 1980. He was uh, chief responsible for disarmament affairs mm. at the UN and, uh, and then became uh, chairman of the board of uh, CIPRI. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was Rolf and Frank in tandem who uh, recruited me. So I went to, uh, uh, to CIPRI in mm. the autumn of 1980. Mm -hmm. There was the review conference for the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty in Geneva in August to my recollection and I went straight from there to, uh, mm. uh, to Cypri. I remember that because mm. I, I met Rolf one evening and he said to me, uh, uh, aren't you supposed to be at, at, at Cypri by, by, by today? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, as soon as this conference is over. <laughs> I'm going straight there. Yes. Okay. And, um, and who was at Cypri at this time? And there were the two Franks. Mm -hmm. uh, the two Franks, uh, Frank Barnaby, Frank Blackaby, mm -hmm. the names almost similar and uh, mm -hmm. uh, almost the same, and the personalities are very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, Dan Smith always used to refer to them as FB1 and FB2, I remember. Two, yeah. Frank Blackaby 1, Frank yeah. Barnaby 2. Or yeah. Two very different entities. Mm -hmm. Frank Blackaby was an economist, mm. uh, Frank Barnaby a physicist. Mm. Uh, Cipri in 1980, uh, it was very well funded, mm. uh, it still is by the yes. way, mm. but then it was exclusively uh, Swedish money. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, in the beginning there, very beginning there, uh, under Frank Barnaby, uh, if we were to travel abroad, we would travel on Cypri money, because the institution should be seen to be totally independent. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, by that time, still, it could afford uh, to do it that way. Mm -hmm. But this was, uh, this was something with which, uh, not the, the uses of money, but uh, I was brought up, you know, in uh, a strong tradition emphasizing, first of all, that whatever we did uh, should be based on publicly available material. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, whatever we did, it should be published. Uh, it should all be in the public domain. Mm. And uh, independence was, uh, you know, very high up on uh, on the list of concerns. Mm. And mm. that was the same with Cipri. It was only that Cipri was uh, was so well funded mm. that it could do more out of it than than we could, mm. in a sense, do here. Mm. Uh, in in Cipri's case, because of Gunnar Mudal and Alva, mm. uh, there was a special lex Cipri. 
uh, approved by Parliament really? on the initiative of the Budals, mm -hmm. which made it possible to, to provide cost of living allowances and housing allowances free of, free of tax. Mm. And, uh, and hence uh, it was possible to recruit uh, uh, high quality international staff. Mm. This is something that has slightly puzzled us in talking to people from, well, from here and from and from Cypri. We talked we talked to Frank uh, last week. Mm -hmm. We tried to get hold of Mary Caldor, but the relationship with government, but in particularly the financial relationship, doesn't seem to have worried anybody either in Prio or in Cypri. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, there's an attitude to some degree in Britain, or there used to be an attitude in Britain, and there's certainly an attitude in the United States that one should not get too closely connected with government mm. and government money. Mm. It's a very different sort of attitude here in Scandinavia. Different Why? traditions and different contexts. Mm. Uh, uh, we have no uh, significant uh, tradition for foundations, uh, mm. private foundations. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, things... Uh, have been financed by the state somehow, mm. to a much larger extent yeah. than elsewhere in Europe and, uh, and first of all in the United States. Mm. Mm. Uh, so that's one part of it. Um, but true, uh, when Cypri had visitors, typically a deputy foreign minister, mm. uh, asking about Cypri and how are you financed, mm. uh, well, uh, by the uh, Swedish government, and how can you then be independent? No, good question. Uh, good question. However, um, the answer to it is that um, uh, the value of, of Cypri for Sweden uh, followed from the fact that uh, the Swedes never tried to influence the contents of what Cypri was doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, had uh, the government tried to do that, CIPRI would have been another Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Mm. And uh, that would have been an entirely different uh, uh, cup of tea. Yeah. So the Swedes had a self-interest mm. in, uh, in, uh, in having CIPRI run in an independent fashion. Mm -hmm. And that way CIPRI got a high standing and that way CIPRI could address the United Nations mm. on important occasions and, and be present throughout. Mm. It was a Swedish contribution to independent peace research in a special sector, uh -huh. <coughs> the world military sector. Yeah. And would the same apply to PRIO in, in a somewhat broader sector? Because a lot of PRIO money eventually, I think, came from, came from the Norwegian government. Uh, from the Norwegian government, but much of it also from the National Research Council uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and other sources. Mm. So it was um, a longer list of, of sources mm. uh, here, then and now. Mm. But it is interesting because uh, the first question anybody ever asks me if I go to another country and uh, say I'm carrying out a project on local peace building, the first question they ask me is where I'm from. Mm. And the second question is who's paying for this? Right. And uh, you, have to have you have to get both answers right uh, mm. Mm. before they'll let you go on yeah. and do what you want yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah. So, sure. But uh, I guess it doesn't help that we come from Washington DC when we, when we do this. Well known from uh, communications theory that uh, uh, more important than the message, uh, uh, or whether you come across, uh, mm. depends, may depend less on the, on the message uh, than on the messenger. Mm. Yeah. What is known about the messenger. Well, it's very uh, true. Uh, yeah. People do actually sort of leap to conclusions when they know where the messengers come from, you see. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were at CIPRI, uh, did you say five years? Six years. Six years. Uh -huh. And during that time, you um, kept on with your work on nuclear nonproliferation? Uh, that was not central to it at CIPRI. Mm. Um, mm. I, I was heading uh, CIPRI's uh, studies of European security affairs. Mm. And uh, during the 80s, my ambition was uh, to, uh, to write an article, a journal article on proliferation issues per year to, mm. keep, uh, to keep in touch with the field. Mm -hmm. uh, but the European security studies were my remit there. Uh -huh. 
Okay. And this was the time of the uh, Euro missile issues and oh, uh, yeah. confidence building mm -hmm. measures mm. Uh, were high up. The Stockholm conference began in right. 84 and so on. Mm. And people started talking about common security around about that time, I indeed, think. Indeed, indeed. Uh, the Palme Commission uh, submitted its report in 81 or 82. Mm. That's yes. And yeah. common security was the mm. conceptual breakthrough. Mm. Mm -hmm. And was Cipri associated with that at all? Made it inputs to it? Uh, to my recollection, a few inputs uh, during the work uh, of the Commission, uh, but uh, we followed it up in, uh, in a major way. Hmm? Uh, we had a major conference in Stockholm on common security back in '83, hmm? and published a book from, uh, from, uh, from what was uh, presented at that conference. Mm. And indeed, uh, common security left a mark on very much of what we were doing uh, at, uh, at CIPRI. Mm. Egon Barr, uh, who uh, maybe contributed more to the uh, development of that concept of common security mm. than anybody else, was mm. on the CIPRI board. Mm -hmm. So we felt, uh, we felt that inspiration to uh, uh, to make as much as possible out of uh, common security. Although I think we realized, at least I came to the conclusion, that common security was a powerful heading. Uh, but it didn't have a conceptual power in the sense that you could sort of uh, derive in mm. logical way uh, very much from, uh, from the concept. Mm. Some policies, yes, but... Uh, uh, then, in due course, we organized a body of thought under that heading mm. of common security. Mm. Yes, well, it was, uh, it was certainly, a, I think the phrase in English would be a catchy, a catchy title, sort of a, it was. a title that sort it of was. sparked off some thoughts and some reactions. Mm. Mm. Um, again, sort of looking back to your own intellectual development, um, were there, were there thinkers, were there people in the field previously whose ideas had a major impact on you? You talked about Johan, of course. Yeah. Uh, but uh, were there any others who uh, were particularly helpful to you in looking at problems of security or problems of uh, arms control and, and nuclear non-proliferation that you look back on and think, he was important, or uh, they're usually he's, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or he gave me some good ideas. Of course, uh, I could list uh, uh, a number of people who uh, meant much to me mm. in what I was doing. Uh, but it was more a matter of, uh, of participating in, uh, in research debates. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the Pugwash setting, for instance, the debate on defensive defense, non-provocative defense, right. mm -hmm. from 83 or so onwards, I mm. was a member of, uh, of the Pugwash working groups on non-provocative uh, defense. Mm. That was a mighty stimulus. Mm. Non-provocative defense was not in the Parliament Commission report. Uh, that came later. Mm. Well, that that yeah. came later. Mm. Yes. And needless to say, you, uh, you interact with, uh, uh, with others and you gain something. Mm. Very few people can uh, function productively uh, just on the basis of inner inspiration, mm. uh, you know, without getting anything from elsewhere. Yeah. Mm. Those are few if they, <laughs> if they exist at all. Mm. Yeah. And usually they're kidding themselves, I think. <laughs> um, one of the things uh, that um, you haven't mentioned uh, when you talked about networks and meetings, uh, though it's implied in what you said about Pugwash, was um, networks across what used to be called the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. uh, was that at all important, do you think, in, uh, in either helping or hindering the development of, of, of PRIO or CIPRI? Because, um, I mean, I, I, I again go back to my own experience of the difficulties that we had in making contact with some Soviet scholars mm. from uh, mm. IMMO, uh, the uh, institute that was 
headed at that stage by Israelovich uh, Gantman. Uh, it was very difficult to do that, but um, did you experience uh, major difficulties in, in sort of building bridges to the east, or was it relatively easy in your case from here or from Stockholm? First of all, it was part of the rationale, of the rationale for peace research mm. uh, here and in, uh, in Stockholm mm. uh, to work uh, across the uh, dividing line mm. between mm -hmm. east and west. And the difficulties then are the uh, you know, well-known ones. Mm. Um, but we did have uh, always uh, quite a bit of contact uh, mm. across, the, uh, across the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. And Cypri always had uh, researchers uh, from the, uh, as we used to say, then the Eastern Bloc. Mm. And the Cypri governing board had, uh, had members uh, from, the, uh, from the East. Mm -hmm. So it was built into into peace research and it was a part of the uh, it was part of the institution building mm -hmm. the institution building seems to have um, developed in Scandinavia uh, from the seed that Prios sort of planted I mean I think Prio was the first I think it was it one that was genuinely pioneering in that it didn't have any models to build on and then it did seem to me that um, though Cipri was set up under different conditions, uh, Cipri was sort of followed suit, and then there were others, uh, Tampari in, uh, in Finland, mm. you had contacts mm. with, with right, scholars right, there, right, right. Lund and Uppsala, there was this sort of network yeah, yeah. of Scandinavians yeah. that uh, were probably, you know, part of this ongoing um, contacts and you know, research uh, conversations that, that you used. Um, was that important in, in the development of your thinking? And, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Uh, those uh, Nordic uh, peace research groups uh, had, uh, you know, close relations with each other. Mm. And then came, uh, then, uh, then came the Germans. Really? Uh, mm. Following a speech by uh, Gustav Heinemann. Mm. Uh, I dare not say the year, maybe as early as uh, 69. Really? Mm. Um, where he uh, championed peace research. And uh, peace research uh, uh, developed uh, fast and well in Germany. Mm. Uh, Dieter Zengas, yes. uh, Klaus Jürgen Ganzel, Ulrich Albrecht, others. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we got uh, a number of uh, uh, very interesting German colleagues. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now that's a side that we, I think we've neglected in this particular project, and certainly we need to do something oh, about that. Has been important. The, yeah, the German end of things. Um, hmm. uh, so when you came to the end of your time at Cipri, what then? What uh, what was your next? Move? Then it was time to return to uh, Oslo mm -hmm. <coughs> and to to Prio mm -hmm. uh, to become head of Prio. Mm -hmm. And uh, that meant uh, for me uh, organizational changes, uh, uh, rather big organizational changes. Mm -hmm. uh, it is fair to say, I think you would hear that from others, that uh, Prio had for some years been in troubled waters, mm -hmm. very troubled mm -hmm. waters. Yes, people have done <clears throat> this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, small scale revision was not uh, the thing to set out for. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, general overhaul mm. of the institution mm -hmm. and I was appointed uh, uh, director for uh, a certain period of time. Mm. Uh, I don't quite remember if this was four years or five years but anyhow uh, I became director on 1 January 87 mm -hmm. and I stayed till uh, August uh, 92. Mm when I left for Geneva. Mm -hmm. And uh, what particular direction did you think the Institute should go uh, from that point onwards and where did you try and steer it? This was, uh, this was a fairly, uh, I shouldn't say big debate, but we had to sort of find out what to focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, a small institution could not be present in all worlds. Mm. 
Um, I remember there was a debate about development research, the role of development research mm. at, uh, at uh, PRIO. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the anchor of development research had in the meantime become the Christian Mikkelsen uh, Institute in, in Bergen. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, we, scaled, uh, we scaled that down. Mm. Uh, I happened to get uh, uh, five, six uh, uh, very promising uh, historians uh, into the uh, institute. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, not historians interested in medieval history, but uh, rather interested in contemporary mm -hmm. affairs. Mm -hmm. Some one of them, are. one of them is the current director of, of Prio, Stein Tunnison. Ah. Uh -huh. And others have done very well too mm. in that group. Uh, we historians are often very useful. I concur. Mm. So historians came in and uh, development was downgraded a little bit. Uh, what? what? Well, the, the institution focus? grew, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It became larger. I, I, was, I was well treated by the, by the government. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, uh, and so the size of the institute, uh, I think the budget was probably doubled mm -hmm. in, that, in that period. But first of all, uh, uh, the organization, organization changed. Mm -hmm. uh, new routines and long-term perspectives on things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, PRIO has, I think you would find they have stayed with those statutes. Uh, yeah, you have to check up on that, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what has happened uh, over the years. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, more or less, uh, CIPRI has de uh, PRIO has developed uh, on the basis of, uh, of that organizational stru structure that mm -hmm. was introduced in that period. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also a, ma a matter of making the institute um, reaching out making it uh, respectable in the sense that uh, what uh, what we said uh, could be listened to. Mm -hmm. uh, there mm -hmm. was a time when that was not the case. Mm. Did you look at the field as a whole and say uh, this is where there are necessary things to be done, there are places here that nobody is inter seemed interested in researching? Uh, did you fit it into a number of niches uh, or did you th um, use the uh, the skills and talents of the people that you brought in to look at things that they were interested yeah, that, in? That had to be a combination. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, you identify things you would like to do, but then the next thing is uh, uh, you have to find the proper people to do it. Mm. Or you find uh, intelligent, good researchers uh, coming in with their agendas. Mm. And uh, then you do it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Stay in Tennyson, whom I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, he was at the Institute for Defense, uh, defense uh, history uh, at that time as a young, young uh, historian. Mm. And I, uh, I sensed I ought to bring him into PRIO and that succeeded. Mm. Well. And Stein wrote his, uh, Stein wrote his uh, doctor's uh, his dissertation mm. on uh, Vietnamese history, the revolution in ah. Vietnam in uh, in forty six, mm -hmm. and uh, Stein has followed up on that, and uh, he is one major voice on uh, on uh, not only on Asian history but um, modern Asian history, mm -hmm. but uh, on Asian politics mm -hmm. uh, these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Looked at from London, I think at this time, one of the things that um, struck us about Prio. I think it was perhaps before you were there, is that they were one of the few places in the peace research spectrum that took any interest in Africa at all. Now, was that mm. the result of your coming in or was that a little earlier? That was earlier, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Norwegian development aid goes back to the beginning of the 50s, but the first project was in India, in mm. Kerala. But uh, rather, rather soon, uh, development aid was first of all a matter of Africa. Mm. Mm. And uh, much followed from that. Mm. Mm. Yes, I remember in the late 1960s paying a number of visits to Ethiopia, and the only people who seemed to be working there were the, Nor the Norwegians' development. Mm. Mm. Uh, the Norwegians helping the Ethiopian Navy, of all things. And uh, I think the Americans were oh, there really? be 
because they had a huge communications base up in the, the north of the country. Yes, right? yes, I, I mm. seem to remember that. Mm. Yeah. We did some early studies on, uh, or that was Peter Wallenstein in Uppsala, uh, did some, some mm. studies on, on sanctions against Rhodesia. Uh, this was in the end of the 60s. Mm. Yeah. So there, there was more than one inroad into Africa, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I think development aid was the major one. Mm. Yeah. Uh, talking about the historians that you um, uh, persuaded to become part of PRIO when you were directors, uh, the, the field's always aimed at being multidisciplinary. Do you think we've actually succeeded in, 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 in that? And, uh, and does it matter? Does, is it important uh, to have different sort of disciplinary inputs into the field? Problems uh, do not know uh, scientific disciplines. Mm -hmm. They are virtually always uh, uh, multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And so if you are problem oriented, uh, and peace research of course is, mm. maximization of peace is the objective. Mm. It follows that um, uh, since there is a limit to how much you can build into one single person, you ought to rec recruit uh, from uh, mm. many different disciplines mm. uh, to get a good team. Mm. And uh, this is uh, something that has been accepted over the years. For instance, where I'm sitting uh, right now, my mm. board has accepted that uh, uh, people can very well be recruited to this institute, mm -hmm. uh, not only on the basis of individual merits, uh, but also uh, out of uh, considerations regarding how to get the best possible team. Mm. Mm -hmm. And did you do that with, uh, with Prio when you became director? Was that at the back of your that mind? That was absolutely at the back of, uh, of my mind. Mm. Uh, uh, there wasn't all, all that much uh, sort of uh, leeway to, uh, to do it, but mm. uh, uh, sociology, political science, uh, history. Mm. Uh, we had on and off a little bit of natural sciences involved too. Mm. Uh, remember that um, in the field of arms control, uh, the traditional way of recruiting to that field was from physics mm, yes. in the 1960s. Very much so, yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm. And I remember we had at, at uh, Prio 2 a period of time a physicist linked to uh, uh, my studies on proliferation mm. issues and, uh, and linked to others who also worked on uh, arms control and disarmament mm. matters. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about an agenda for peace uh, and the, the sort of process that was laid out there, the, um, the whole of the field seems to have become very complicated and diverse. Uh, the nomenclature has changed. I mean, we talk about you know, peacekeeping, peace building, peacemaking, and then conflict prevention, conflict uh, mitigation. Uh, at the very beginning of the field, did people imagine that it was going to become this extremely diverse uh, field, discipline with subfields? Uh, after all, it has become you know, really quite a, a huge and very varied field. Johan Gautung uh, developed the terminology under the um, heading of conflict management. Conflict mm -hmm. management was about about all the sorts of things that you mentioned right now. Yeah. Uh, so he made, he made some early steps uh, uh, into a more refined uh, conceptual uh, frame mm -hmm. yeah. for analysis. Uh, but then uh, I think you have to go up to 1992 or so uh, mm. to see the first references to the entire chain that you mentioned. And this was a report, uh, a report uh, by Butrus Gali, oh, an agenda for uh, peace, an agenda for peace, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, which did much to set the new agenda post uh, post Cold War. Mm, mm -hmm. um, a new agenda had to be set because uh, because whenever the UN got involved in a new conflict, it was like starting it uh, all over again because no new case seemed to be like the previous ones. And we got also uh, uh, a, um, uh, a list of uh, different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of peace operations. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, uh, it has dawned, of course, on people that uh, uh, post-conflict reconstruction and conflict prevention uh, uh, mm -hmm. 
the operative the operative uh, implications are very much the same mm. because of, because also after conflict in in the, in the reconstruction phase uh, the task is very much to avoid that uh, uh, developments slide back into conflict mm. so it mm. is very much a matter of prevention still mm. so the operative agendas are virtually identical mm -hmm. uh, the theories may be different uh, because uh, pre-conflict, uh, uh, the actor constellation might not be clear. Mm. Uh, it might be a question of analyzing structures for what they might uh, might indicate for the future uh, conflict mm. or harmonious development. Whereas after conflict, a conflict has taken place, after a war has taken place, uh, the actor constellation might be only too clear. Mm -hmm. And the attitudes and feelings of those who've just been through the conflict might be rather different as well. Yeah. Certainly true. Mm, yeah. uh -huh. uh, so uh, you seem to be implying that Johann you know, envisaged this particular constellation of well that, in advance. Uh, of that I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, you have to ask him, but, uh, but he made some, uh, some uh, very important early approaches mm. uh, into the uh, terminologies of the field uh, in the 1960s. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we were, the youngsters at that time, we were all sort of brought into that mm. and uh, uh, familiarized ourselves uh, with that. Mm. So perhaps an agenda for peace was not quite the bombshell for you that it was for other people. It wasn't a bombshell, no. Mm. I think peace researchers probably uh, uh, found uh, more in the agenda of peace that they had heard about before than, mm. than most others. Mm. Yeah. I guess so. Um, but you should keep in mind uh, uh, Petrovsky, Vladimir Petrovsky, uh, who was... Uh, who was uh, head of the Department of Political Affairs at the UN mm. uh, during the first one year of Butros' reign. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a, a Russian, a Soviet mm. deputy foreign minister who spent time with peace researchers. Really? Yeah. Well, I remember when I, when I was director of PRIO, uh, Petrovsky came to PRIO. Mm. I promised to bring Galtung up from wherever he was and, uh, and we sat down and, uh, and discussed. Mm -hmm. Uh, something may have passed on that chain, for what I know, but, uh, mm. uh, well, this is just uh, a hypothesis, something I'm thinking about uh, not knowing. Mm. Well, one never really does know, does one? Absolutely certainly that something has had an this effect. Is so, <coughs> this is so true. Yeah. This is so true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we talked a lot about Johan, but I wondered if there were other Looking back on the whole field of peace research over the years, other major figures, who would you say is responsible, f apart from the people we've mentioned, mm. for mm. developing this whole you know, quite extraordinarily diverse uh, field of study that we've got now? Because I think we do have a huge field of study. Who, who comes to mind, apart from... Um, I Johan think, yeah. and, and Rotblatt and mm. people like that. Mm. I, I mentioned in brief, in passing, Dieter Zengas, yes. uh, who became important, uh, mm. both for his analysis, analysis of, of armaments dynamics mm. and for later on for his work on, uh, on development issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, he was a very important figure. Yeah. Peter Wallenstein, mm. what do you think? Yeah, Certainly. Mm. Uh, uh, the um, Nord Nordic uh, uh, well, peace research related to development mm -hmm. got a uh, got a home in Gothenburg, mm. Björn Hetne. Um, there was a small group in Lund, southern Sweden. Håkan Wiberg uh, later on went to Copenhagen and became director of COPRI, the Copenhagen Peace mm -hmm. Research Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, merged, merged into a bigger conglomerate mm -hmm. in Denmark now. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize Håkan had started in Lund. Yeah. Okay. He did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the, the question that I ask everybody and, and, uh, because we get good answers out of it, which is supposing you, you were me and you were interviewing you, 
What question would you want to be asked that I haven't asked you that would give you an opportunity to say something that you really want to say about the development of the field? What haven't I asked? Uh, maybe one of the most important questions uh, would be how do you reach out? How do you uh, achieve results? Uh, how do you make people listen to what you are saying, given that peace research is, uh, is uh, applied research? The mm. only problem with raising that question is that I don't know the answer very well. Cipri, Cipri had a kind of a superficial answer, mm -hmm. given to Cipri by Gunnar Myrdal. Uh, Gunnar Myrdal who said, uh, if only people knew what was happening in the world military sector, they would better know how to take action against it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, there has been something to that. Uh, CIPRI has had and still uh, has mm -hmm. an important function in, uh, in that respect, making what is happening in the world military sector more transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it doesn't uh, lead very far. It doesn't lead far enough, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, ask ourselves over and over again that question, how do we uh, get across? Mm -hmm. We've always had that question because we've always said, yes, we are practical, yes, we are applied, yes, we try to affect the real world, and nobody I've spoken to yet has come up with a definitive answer. We've come up with partial answers, I think. Yeah. My colleague from the University of Kent says, you know, our work goes on through our students, and uh, that's true in a certain sense. but. Yeah, I think one, one important criterion, but, uh, but this applies to, uh, to uh, scholarly works in general, is that uh, if a product of research, if a good peace research contribution uh, can start a debate, mm. then much is achieved. Mm. I think that's a quality criterion, which is much underestimated uh, at, uh, mm. in academic life. Mm. Um, we all know uh, some such examples. Uh, Huntington, right or wrong, mm. uh, started the big debate. Now then you have impact. Mm. For good or bad, hard to say always, but, uh, but you have an impact. Mm. And uh, uh, that American who, sit, who, who was sitting in Brussels writing about uh, Europeans are from one planet and Americans are from another planet, Venus and Mars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, he, uh, he triggered uh, a big debate mm. on, uh, on, on important uh, themes. Mm. Uh, it is difficult to, to vector uh, this into uh, evaluations at universities when people apply for positions. And still I think this is a very important criterion. Have we been able to trigger as a debate of significance mm. others tying in? Well, if so, uh, it has been meaningful. Mm.